so we can post this up to YouTube when we're all done for the folks who couldn't make it. And uh, so in jest, I usually insert a slide here talking about myself. By day, I sling code in various polyglot languages. And by night, I pretend to be a Linux tinkerer. Uh, and I'll be posting the, uh, the slides as well as the link to the repo uh, for today's stuff uh, up to my uh, personal website, as well as emailing it out here. But the, the main presentation of the night and why we have uh, at least I think a couple people tuning in here is uh, we're going to be talking about Jupyter Lab, a little bit of uh, stupid Python, uh, Pi environment sort of stuff, as well as uh, a weird side trip down WSL2 for Windows, uh, which is how I ended up getting enough memory to be able to run some of the stuff. Uh, which, by the way, uh, Docker uh, desktop now enables you to run uh, your uh, Docker stuff inside of WSL2-ish. It's all still a VM, but it's a lot lighter of a VM than it was before. So performance and uh, disk operations and stuff like that have greatly improved. So yay. And uh, if you'll notice uh, through the background of these uh, presentation, this whole presentation, there'll be so somewhat of a reoccur reoccurring theme. So thanks and credit to NASA for our tax dollars uh, taking very beautiful pictures. So as a brief history, uh, the I I Iron Python project uh, existed and sort of Jupiter spun off in 2014 into its own sort of world. Uh, there's been sort of a concept of lab notebooks before that. And why such a weird name? Well, it, it sort of has a set of core languages, Julia, Python, R, etc. But over time, it's become rather um, language agnostic. Um, there's even like a module you can load in .NET uh, to run your, your uh, notebooks. Why you'd want to, I don't know. But We'll uh, see a, a C++ uh, notebook here in a little bit too. So if you really want to, I can't say that it's going to be high, uh, high performance, but sure, you, you can boldly go ahead with it. Uh, so there was Jupyter Notebook and then uh, it became, the, the next generation after that was uh, Jupyter Lab and uh, in 2018, so it's been out for a few years, but I really only just started playing with it uh, because I was curious about it here about a month ago. It basically still will run all your happy notebooks. It's just a new interface and it has some other nice to have things like it can read very large CSV files and dump them out to your web browser. So it it's better in almost every way that I can tell other than the fact that it doesn't look cool and old fashioned like uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, previously did. So here we can see just a screenshot of it. I mean, if it wasn't in your web browser running, you'd think it was almost native. It really, really looks quite cool. You can do all sorts of weird visualizations and it's rather powerful. Apparently, oh, click the wrong direction. But so one of the things, if you just want to play with it and figure out uh, if you like it, uh, they actually for free now will give you a uh, uh, a uh, um, little like almost katakoda sort of thing to uh, play with uh, your your Jupyter notebooks. If you just go to uh, the Jupyter website or this link that I have right here. Uh, let's see here if I, I can figure out how to actually work this. Here we go. So if we, uh, yes, also Google, uh, uh, the Google uh, notebooks, uh, collaboration notebooks are roughly based off of Jupyter. But so here, if we just go to too many windows here on one thing, 
but uh, if we just go to the Project Jupiter website here and scroll down, and you just hit the uh, try it in your browser here, it actually will spin up a VM with all of the stuff here. So we'll just go forward here while it's working on that. And so back to full screen here. And so the, the first uh, lab we're going to sort of, uh, yes, I believe uh, will that uh, GitLab or GitHub just announced that they have the ability to open it and uh, edit your code and all st stuff like that. As well as I just was reading yesterday, I believe that uh, VS Code just now uh, added the ability to, oh, okay, 2017, I'm a little bit behind, but uh, it was Vi Visual Studio Code, I guess, that just announced uh, yesterday that the newest version has the ability to edit uh, the, the notebooks. But so our first example here, we'll be just playing around with uh, uh, Hello World in C++ because I mean, that's not something you see every day in a web notebook. So uh, if we flip out here, so as you can see, it's launched a full-blown uh, Jupyter lab, and they were uh, really nice and gave us about two gigs of memory. If you start trying to do a COVID-19 analysis on it as a demo, it will totally crash it out the, uh, the kernel and stop running. I know, I tried it. Uh, but so one of the cool things you can do is actually upload a, a notebook from your uh, own uh, stash here and then actually open it up. So here we are in my Hello World uh, notebook here. And as you can see, the first thing I'm going to test is just importing and writing out Hello World, nice and simple. And uh, some other stuff to call out here. This is in uh, markup, so one hash. Showing, do you think you're showing that on your web browser? I should be. No. I'm just seeing the Adobe. Adobe. Okay. Uh, just uh, yeah. let's try focusing again here. This whole time we could only see the uh, PDF. Apologies here. Uh, let's. I'm also kind of curious when you get a chance then. Oh, yeah. We can see the C++ um, notebook right now. Yes. Yes. So you were curious then? Uh, it, when you play around with Python in the notebook, I have a question for you to see if a feature is still supported or not. Okay, yeah, um, we can totally flip over to a uh, Python notebook here in just a second. But as you can see, this is just your standard markup. If we add another uh, Octothorpe there and render it, you can see it's a second header rather than a first header. If you know Wikipedia, it's really easy. And uh, one of the, the biggest use cases that I uh, love about uh, the, the notebooking is uh, actually at my work, which all of my comments are my own, not theirs uh, as usual, but uh, uh, we actually, uh, one of my uh, coworkers used it to document a library that I'd written for them. And uh, they, they were able to not only uh, document how it was supposed to be used far better than I, my documents were, uh, they also uh, were able to show me and share a notebook with me to show me where I'd screwed up and made it not work right. So it, it helped greatly for collaboration. But as you can see here, it's just your standard hello world. And uh, this is just a real simple, stupid uh, way of calculating pi rather poorly. If you start out with just one of them, as you can see, it says eh, it's four. And then the, the more iterations that you make through, uh, the higher precision you end up getting. But performance wise, oh. So you, one, one thing that you can see here, I actually have to uh, run, since this is the first time this notebook's run, that code actually hadn't been brought into uh, memory yet. So 
as you can see, it completely blew up not knowing how to calculate pi. Uh, that was not intentional, but so we went ahead and ran uh, this code, brought it in so it now knows about pi, and now it calculated right. Uh, let's see, someone said something, sorry here. Uh, whoever had commented something, my chat seems to have gone away. Uh, just go ahead and unmute yourself. Press Alt-H, by the way. That's the best way to help out with the chat. There right. it goes now. Yeah. Uh, oh, huh. okay. Yeah, I'll make sure to put that off in the corner here. Uh, but so anyway, though, as you can see, I guess you can run, sci if you want to call it scientific computing here in uh, inside of C++. Uh, another big thing to call out here is if you just want to open up a CSV that's far too big to open up in Excel, uh, of course, it's not going to do well while I'm uh, trying to present here apparently, but I swear last night this would actually open to be a, a CSV file. So we'll, we'll just keep going ahead here while that's opening. I can speak from experience that it will open up to uh, a 300 megabyte CSV file or any other type of streaming uh, um, data. I learned that when I was at NOAA when scientists were looking at satellite weather data in Python notebooks and then complaining about how slow it was. So this is just one of their Hello World uh, Python files, but as you can see, uh, they're bringing in actually uh, matplotlib uh, and then doing all sorts of uh, things with, if we look at how they're making the pretty, uh, math equations look, you can see they're just using straight up uh, LaTeX uh, formulas snuck in there. So makes it look really profound and like you're really smart and know what you're talking about. And so when we go to actually go running and solving some stuff, you can see the, the visualizations just look profound. Uh, and as for other different ways of looking at things, you, if you're in the genetic uh, world, you can actually uh, import uh, FASTA files. And actually visualize uh, genetic data as well there. Uh, this looks to be like, uh, uh, reads of uh, the Zika genome, apparently. And the, this is just all in the fun free uh, demo uh, notebooks that they, they included in to show what they can do. Uh, if we look there, you can see our CSV file finally opened and it is a rather large number of rows. No wonder it took a while to open and then a lot of columns. I, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing with this. It looks like it's just uh, uh, sensor data from a uh, vehicle. But other fun stuff you can uh, import in R and do fun, uh, stupid R stuff as well. There's always the question, is, is there actually good R code? I, I've never seen any, at least not production. But, uh, and then one of the other big things to call out here is that you can change what kernel your uh, current notebook's in, take your pick, whatever you have installed, or you can even steal someone else's kernel from another uh, notebook you have open. Uh, the plus here is where you'll add in and open up other uh, notebooks. Uh, the console is a great uh, 
great option here if you just want to uh, try out some code and uh, a sort of code on the fly here. Help if I move my, there we go. So, we can do as a Python, there we go. Or if you just want to be in the, the wide world of the terminal here, you can Google it. Well, if you knew the password, uh, you could actually do all sorts of fun stuff in here, but, and apparently they have a rather limited number of things that you can actually do in there. But wget exists. Um, Chad wrote, see what the uh, awesome system release is. So yeah, let's go. Cat. Yeah. Cat. Star dash release. Or yeah. Uh, so it's Ubuntu eighteen oh four Bionic, apparently. So fairly up to date, long term server fun stuff there. Uh, can you one last thing? Can you uh, do a cat on proc CPU or sorry, mem info? Just kind of curious how much uh, memory it's got available. Oh wow, that's actually kind of sizable. Considering it was only reporting that it had uh, 2048 meg actually there. Maybe it's not reporting right. Regardless, thank you for uh, for pulling that up. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of curious. Uh, what about uh, CPU? 512 gigabyte. Uh, here, let me just rerun it here. So that's. Uh, Let's see, that would be Meg. Mm -hmm. okay. That can't be right. 53, unless maybe it's uh, showing as the entire uh, machines and they're, they're just limiting you uh, through other uh, fashions. Yeah. That, that must be. Yeah, top is showing, agreeing. I wonder if this is like running inside of a Docker image or something like that. That would explain it, possibly. Anyway, though, so yeah, you can do, if you don't have access to the machine in any other way, you can uh, easily play, have some fun shell uh, stuff here. But, or if you just want to write your next uh, novel, you can have a full uh, markdown. And then say, I don't know what that really gets you much, but. I believe so if you use the triple backticks in the markdown and you specify what language you want to use, it should be able to make code that you can display and run within the, uh, um, the markdown. Or at least previously in, in older versions, you could do that. Uh, no, triple back ticks, it would have to be surrounded in, just like you would do like a code block in uh, GitLab Markdown. So like that? Yeah, that would be a comment then. But yeah. There you go. 
Okay, well, anyway though, as you can see, I am definitely not a uh, pro user. So, uh, let's see, the uh, other big stuff that, to call out here is that, um, where did they put it here? Uh, so uh, there are a set of uh, third-party extensions that you can install into your uh, Jupyter Lab it, as soon as they update here. Uh, everything from uh, being able to uh, visualize uh, FASTA files, uh, GeoJSON, uh, take your notebooks offline, etc. And it is only showing us the stuff that was installed, not all of the other stuff. But you can integrate it with uh, Git, uh, GitLab, uh, all sorts of other different uh, modules uh, if you're not inside their little walled uh, garden right now here. But so anyway, though, enough playing with the, the free one out in the world here. Uh, if we just close out of it, we'll be uh, ready to dive into uh, the next part of the uh, the presentation here. Uh, so I, think I need to switch my, okay, you should be able to see my full screen now. Uh, so uh, I want more, I want to run it on my local machine here. So the, the first thing is I do have a uh, GitLab uh, repo with everything that I've been playing with here, if you want to follow along at home. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, set everything up on uh, Ubuntu 20.04. Uh, if you want to start from the beginning, it's just uh, docker run dash p to forward on uh, the port uh, 8088, uh, and then just the Ubuntu 2004. Uh, if you want to skip ahead from a whole bunch of stuff that I ended up having to install to run different kernels and stuff, uh, you can just use my uh, image here, uh, which I will, uh, let's see, the select tool, there we go. I will paste into the comments here, uh, And then the, the link here, and Will, I haven't forgotten about your, your Python fun here either there. Actually, you already answered the question. Oh, and you okay. Showed, um, so previously in Jupyter Notebooks, you could identify a variable in one of the run blocks and you could call it up later on depend, uh, with, you know, with uh, whatever language. However, only in Python would it keep some type of, like if you set memory in one uh, part of it, would it be available in the later part of the notebook? You showed in the C++ one that when you ran the Pi uh, stuff, that it would actually run, set in memory, and you can call up in a, pre, in a, uh, in a follow up uh, code, running code block, which previously that was only available for Python, which was an issue because I had some people that were trying to use Python notebooks, or sorry, Jupyter notebooks with Perl. Yeah, so the one heartburn that I did run into is if you try and define a function in C++ more than once, it will actually blow up at you and yell at you, as one would expect. So it's treating it just like one big, you, you started at the top and you execute it all the way down, and it just remembers where you were at. So that, that's both a blessing and a curse. Good to know. I, I forgot to show that part there, but uh, with the, the one heads up that uh, the, this image that uh, I, I linked there is rather good sized, is not optimized in any sort of way, and uh, is not either secure, production ready, or even safe for life necessarily. So if it uh, does any bad things, the standard disclaimers have been had. Uh, 
so if we want to go ahead and uh, start into here, uh, as you can see, we're running inside of uh, uh, the, the new Microsoft uh, terminal there. And the other big thing to show before we go diving in very far here is if you go into the Docker desktop settings, into your uh, general, uh, the latest version, if you're all the way up to date, you'll, you can just click the use the WSL2 based engine. And then the other big gotcha is if you go into resources, WSL integration, enable integration with my default WSL distro. The, that way from uh, WSL here, you actually can just run it as if you're in Linux like normal. And in Bizarro land, it just ends up working. So here we go. Let's just go ahead and drop into a real bit of Linux. And uh, the other big heads up is, yes, I realize I'm running this all as root, but YOLO, we might as well just go for it because it's only Bizarro land root. So the, the setup uh, really, since we're inside of Docker, you don't really need to set up virtual env, but uh, it's a great way if you're not inside of a Docker environment to be able to install all the fun libraries that you want to play with without actually hosing your entire machine or running into dependency hell. So I just wanted to show it and uh, sort of call it out here. So let's just go ahead and install it. Tabs matter or spaces matter. I believe you need a hyphen between apt and get. Uh, well, that works. Well, that should have installed all that stuff. Let's see if it's just a matter of the heck is going on today there that's try weird. python 3 pip and sometimes it's like pip 3 or pip 37 yeah le let me quick flip over to my actual notes rather than my uh uh screen notes here uh so all of those should have been already installed. I wonder, can I get away with? If you do a witch pip. Yep, there we go. Okay, so uh, let, let's just take a look at what my, my Docker uh, image is actually uh, doing here so we don't have to sit through as it installs our base, our CRAN and all of these other things that take like forever to install. So what I installed was uh, git, r, a bunch of r stuff, node.js, uh, python3, the build essentials, a bunch of other li libraries that it needed. Uh, I threw .NET in there just in case I had time to get to it. And then uh, also installed uh, virtual env, which is what I was actually needing to do here was uh, that command there. But, and then I also installed uh, some other kernel stuff, the I, I, uh, R kernel for, uh, from R because it took forever to build for some reason. But that's what I get for building from source. Uh, and then also GNU plot so that we could play with that as well. But so anyway, though, once you get your virtual in, uh, installed, to create a new one, we just go ahead and just run this command virtual env for the language three, Py Python three, and it's going to be named my env. So let's just go ahead and so now that we uh, ran the command here and it created one, uh, we'll want to source it to activate it. And what this is, so 
So my env, there we go, helps if I do everything in the right order. So what I did is I created a Bizarro land where this uh, folder, uh, the home myenv bin is where all of my Python stuff now lives. So if we go, which pip, you can see now we're using my pip, not an, anyone else's pip. So now that I have my own little uh, network in a bottle here, let's just go ahead and install JupyterLab. And it's just as simple as asking pip to install it and then waiting a few minutes here. Which thank you for Mediacom for being back up. Otherwise this uh, presentation would have been a lot more painful on the end of a uh, DSL modem. But while that's installing, uh, there we can see, uh, so we don't really need it for Docker, but I know a colleague of mine's wife was uh, complaining about how much heartburn she had getting it set up and her environment's all right. So I figured I'd uh, throw it in as a uh, uh, call out to her. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he, he or her was, were able to make it. But uh, your other options, Conda exists. I know a lot of people really like it. Or you just yell YOLO and go with it and reinstall uh, Linux every once in a while when your uh, environments get totally hosed. Uh, so as I hinted at, we were installing. And then to launch it, just Jupyter Notebook will launch your the, the old notebook or uh, Jupyter Lab will actually launch uh, the new one here. So uh, let's go ahead and set our uh, kernel as the local virtual environment so that we'll be inside the same uh, universe here. And then let's go ahead and launch uh, the local version of Jupyter Lab and see what it looks like by default here. And uh, the big call outs here, since we're inside of Docker, I have to tell it that the IP address is zero, all zeros, and uh, that we should allow root here. And we need to change that because we are forwarding port 8088 there. So as you can see, we're launched and it says, hey, you can either, uh, here's my, uh, different ways of opening it. Um, normally this would be the point that it would pop open a browser, but since we don't have one inside of our Docker container, it uh, just will sort of help you out here. So if we copy and paste, into our new tab here, Okay, maybe it needs to be try again here. Clearly I did not sacrifice enough to the demo gods here. There we go. I should have gone with my notes. So as you can see, we're living in a uh, fairly limited world here. But if we open up our virtual environment, if we execute, oh, if I type the code right and run, there you can see. Uh, one interesting thing to call out, if you want to run a shell command here, you can. Uh, exclamation mark will actually just run it as a bash command. 
And there you can see we just installed pandas into our uh, Pi environment. Well, there we go. Okay, it finished now. So anyway, though, uh, we are rather limited in uh, which uh, kernels we have there. As you can see, we only have uh, Python. Let, let's get some R uh, playing with it here. So if we, we have to exit back out here, And so in order to install uh, uh, R first, you have to install R in the, the machine. We already did that because it takes a long while. And then in R itself, you need to get into R here. Uh, we need to install the, the iron uh, R kernel. Which as you can see, I already did because again, it, takes a while for it to clone down and run. And then we just need to let uh, that it needs to install itself into Jupyter here. All right now, if we relaunch Jupyter, uh, first, if we quit out of R, and relaunch, and refresh. And now you can see we have R. And if we upload a, uh, one of these should be, Anyway, though, uh, now we have R, and it's working and running and happy and etc. Uh, the other big thing to call out here, as you can see, now that we're not in the, that walled garden, we have a lot more uh, uh, cool uh, little libraries that you can install and uh, enable. So uh, you can install uh, LaTeX. Okay, apparently you need to install NPM first. Best part about installing NPM in a container is you can delete the container. True. So anyway, while that's running there, uh, let's see, I think we're Oh yeah, uh, so the exclamation mark uh, will run your commands in the uh, shell. Uh, tab completion is a good thing. Uh, help is rather helpful and as is uh, quick ref is, are two other uh, commands that will open up um, notebooks that are uh, those sort of hello world help ones that we uh, started out with. And then I've got a stack of links here uh, to uh, some various different uh, tutorials here. Oops, if I... And today is definitely not my day. There we go. Uh, this one was rather helpful in setting up and walking you through how to install things and uh, wandering into some rather uh, deep, uh, dark uh, R uh, magic and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, though, that, that was... Um, I think most of what I had, uh, oh, here how to install the GNU plot uh, kernel was the other big one. So uh, WSL2 has improved its speed some, but 
file access is still not quite native, uh, it would appear, as you can tell by the pain of watching things install. But so anyway, though, if anyone has any other uh, fun stuff they, they want us to try or thoughts or questions or snide remarks. As uh, slow as that is going, is that on an SSD? It is not. Oh, okay. It's a uh, hunk of, it's a rather large hunk of uh, spinning no. rust. Uh, and as you can see, my limiting factor is my hard drive. I can say with the WSL1 and an SSD, it's not much different. Um, do you, can you have uh, dev SHM mounted, the in-memory file system? Uh, Just do an LS on it if it's there. I don't know if he knows how. To, did you run this in screen or did you just run it? I I was just running it here, but we can go ahead and open up uh, another. Well, if I click the right spot there. And because it's busy with the other one, it'll take a little bit longer to load the initial shell on this. So just wait. Oh, shit. <laughs> okay. Demo, the, demo guns are also happy with that. The, the heck with this. He'd say control C means control C. Come on, guys. There, problem solved. Uh, so now, what was it that you were looking to do? Uh, oh, dev slash SHM. It's, it's the shared memory mount. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an in-memory file system. OK, cool. Uh, It would appear to work. So that, that'll, that'll keep it in RAM and it won't hit your hard drive. Unless it swaps. Yeah, I don't know where I'm sitting at memory right now. Uh, it looks like I've got about uh, six gigs of uh, wiggle room there. But yeah, for, for the most part, I mean, it's a great improvement over uh, what it used to be under uh, WSL1. Do you know anybody that's got X Windows running halfway decently under WSL2? It shouldn't be any different than WSL1 because it's the same forwarding for X Windows forwarding. Yeah, I mean, if you have the, the X client running on your, uh, uh, inside your, your host there, and then uh, the Windows, X Windows server, or yeah, server is the client, client is the server. X Windows always screwed it up backwards for some reason. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it works. It, it's not great. I, I think, uh, oh, what a year or two ago, we, we tried it uh, trying to do Docker inside of, uh, Docker forwarding inside of X Windows. And it worked great until we opened YouTube. And then it just totally crashed because we, we opened up a Firefox browser and then uh, just went with it. And it, it worked. It, it was a sad, uh, it, it was rather uh, pixely. Yeah, I mean, as long as I can get like VS Code or QT Creator running, but I don't need anything, just a text editor. So, so it's not going cross OS and you're like, eh. So uh, VS Code is, actually has a VS Code remoting module that will actually run stuff inside of WSL2 if you want, if I remember right. Yeah, I just noticed some weird file path glitches. Yeah, uh, so they, it should work. And actually, I believe you can uh, open up uh, VS Code actually in a web browser itself. So you wouldn't necessarily have to do X Windows. 
So that, that might be worth looking into because there, there's some rather cool uh, stuff they've really improved, especially their uh, team collaboration stuff. But yeah, so that, that was most of what I, I had to show tonight. And uh, we, we are here at the, the top of the hour. Uh, so we, we can go ahead and hit uh, uh, stop record here.